Hello, everyone. I'm Perla Treviso uh, from the ProPublica Texas Tribune Investigative Unit. Thank you so much for tuning in for the last day of our multi-day virtual symposium, marking once a year, one year since the Texas winter storm. Catch up on this week's conversation about the state's power grid, the impact of this year's winter storm, and possible connections to extreme weather systems in Texas at texastribune.org slash events. I'm joined today by Selena Shi and Cliff Avery. Thank you so much for joining us. She is the president of the Austin EMS Association, as well as paramedic and intensive care nurse for Dell Seton Medical Center. Previously, she worked at the Texas Impact Tracking Disaster Relief bills after Hurricane Harvey. Avery has been executive director for the Texas State Association of Fire and Emergency Districts since 2007. Previously, he served on the Fleurville City Council and chaired the local library board. Avery is also founder of GCP Association Services, LLC. Thanks again uh, for joining me. Let's, let's get started. You know, we've, we've, we've been talking a lot about the power grid, um, about the reliance of our energy system, about the possible connections to climate change or not of what we saw. But let's take a, a step back and, and talk about why we should be caring about all of this. Both of you were either directly on the ground or in touch um, with other professionals on the ground. And we can start with you, Avery, uh, giving us more of that statewide perspective of what you were hearing that week. And, and I guess we'll we'll start also by, can you tell us a little bit about the Texas State Association of Fire and Emergency Districts for, for those of our viewers who are not as familiar with it? Uh, which is probably about 97.5%. I would imagine the um, the uh, uh, safe D, as we call ourselves, the Texas State Association of Fire and Emergency Districts represents uh, ESDs, uh, emergency services districts. Uh, emergency services districts are local governments created by voters to provide fire protection, uh, emergency medical response, or both. And uh, they are political subdivisions of the state, just like a city or a county. Uh, municipal utility district, uh, and uh, they are overseen by five commissioners that are either appointed or elected. Uh, they vary in size and in complexity. Uh, we have a saying in safety: uh, if you've seen one ESD, you've seen one ESD. Uh, the uh, one of the ESDs in Northwest uh, Harris County uh, has the population of the city of Tulsa. Uh, another out in far west Texas in Brewster County. Uh, they only have a couple of thousand people in that district, but it covers an area that is larger than the state of Delaware. Uh, 10 million Texans live inside uh, ESDs. That is greater in population than 41 of the states. So ESDs play a significant role and, uh, and uh, the, the, they're very important for the safety of Texans. Thank you, Cliff, for for that overview. Can can you tell thank me? you for the let me plug it. I think. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I think think it's helpful to you know to know who we're talking to and and what you represent. Can can you walk us uh, through what you were hearing? You know, I guess um, you know a, a year from from I guess almost to the to the point. Yes. Uh, yeah. What and, hearing, and what were you seeing um, in in different parts of the state? Certainly. Um, yeah, I, I do have to throw in that disclaimer that that I'm not talking for municipal firefighters, uh, even though ESDs do employ firefighters and they have to meet the same standards as a firefighter in Dallas or Austin or Houston. Uh, they are not normally supported by ESDs. They're supported by municipalities. Uh, but I think the challenges that they saw a year ago today are very, very similar to what a municipal firefighter saw. And I, I was impressed, and I'm sure Selena will have some really good uh, information on this, but I was impressed at the ingenuity that uh, first responders were having to uh, employ to get through the storm, right? We had one ESD that had to use its uh, uh, breast trucks, its command vehicles 
to uh, uh, to transport patients to hospitals. They also had to use those same vehicles to get patients out of the hospital after they'd been treated, or else the hospital would have had to shut down. In uh, Bear County, one ESD had to uh, 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 shuttle nurses to the hospital because if the nurses had gotten in their cars, they would have ended up on the side of the road and that they wouldn't have been able to help anybody. Uh, one, the image that sticks with me most uh, was in Denton County, where Denton County ESD number one had to rescue a horse that had fallen through the ice in a, into a frozen pond. And, uh, and that to me was kind of a very dangerous way to do something very similar to pulling a cat out of a tree. Selena, you, you know, we've emergency responders face a wide range of challenges that we can. And actually, I think I came across you because you were posting some of this on social media, kind of trying to bring awareness to what you were dealing with. We, you know, we just heard in, in, in some communities, it was pulling horses and others, you know, it, the, the roads were icy, the, you know, the ambulances were not equipped to drive through those conditions. Can you walk us through what you personally experienced uh, that week, but also what you heard from your colleagues from Travis County experience? Yeah, thank you so much for having us speak today. Um, and like you said, my name is Selena. I'm president of the Austin EMS Association. We represent over 500 medics that um, do 911 for Austin Travis County EMS. Um, and absolutely, that week was, I think, one of the most challenging um, for our public safety organizations in um, a generation. Um, I remember the weekend before Valentine's Day weekend last year, um, I remember how bad the roads were starting to get and how they were really, really starting to ice over. Um, our medics started uh, emailing around tips on how to get up the overpasses or when um, to not even try to go up the overpasses um, and allow police vehicles and um, fire vehicles to go up those overpasses um, because they're weighted differently to actually bring down patients, um, really prolonging uh, patient care. Um, and even that weekend, um, we started seeing fatalities. Um, somebody got out of their vehicle that was stranded and was struck by another vehicle that lost control um, and they were sent off the overpass and died. And so from that minute, we knew that this year's ice storm was going to be really, really different. Um, I think five years ago, Austin had another ice storm. And I remember we also could not go over or on the overpasses at that time. And I remember one of the ambulances that I was in um, sliding and we actually had to use our lug nuts against the side of the rail. And I absolutely was concerned that we would go over. So ice is nothing new. Um, but this year we really, um, knew that things were going to be really different and catastrophic. I worked, um, on the ambulance on Monday, um, after all of the snow had fallen and overnight, so many people lost power. And I remember my first shift, coming on, um, I was talking to the medics before me and they were telling me that, um, that there were just many, many calls waiting to be answered because EMS was stretched so thin that we just did not have the resources. And we were hearing that um, from the police departments and fire departments that we work with. And so when I got on the ambulance and I started seeing the type of emergencies, it was really shocking. Um, I think even I, as um, an emergency worker didn't realize how many people in our community are really vulnerable, um, especially medically vulnerable. Um, so the first call that I ran on, it was somebody who um, normally I bet has never needed EMS in the past that takes care of all of his medical issues. Um, he's on an oxygen concentrator. And when his electricity went out, he switched his oxygen bottles, but then he ran out of oxygen and he, he just assumed that the power would come back on because these were supposed to be rolling blackouts. Um, and then at a certain point, he ran out of oxygen and the power did not come back on. So he had to call EMS. Um, our ambulance couldn't actually even make it to his house because he lived on a hill. So we needed other vehicles to go get him and bring him to our ambulance. And when they brought him to our ambulance, his oxygen was half the level that it should have been. And he was almost unconscious at that point. Um, and I remember providing him with oxygen. 
um, and reviving him to a certain point. But when you're so oxygen deprived and then you get some oxygen, you can actually start getting really combative. And so at that point, um, I wanted to intubate the patient, but it's really not safe to do so by yourself. And so I thought about um, letting uh, the medic who was driving me know that we needed to pull over, get um, a fire truck to get assistance to intubate this person. But we were on Mopac. It was icy. It would have taken the fire truck 20 minutes um, and probably longer, depending on how many calls they were getting. And so we just made the decision to ride into the hospital that way. Um, and that is a, a medic's worst nightmare to think about um, bringing a patient into the hospital who's really not doing well when you have the tools to help them do better. And so we just had to make these really, really challenging decisions that we have never, ever had to make in the past before. Um, we saw a lot of people who rely on electricity um, for many different types of medical devices. A lot of people are on at-home dialysis. Um, a lot of people go to dialysis clinics and need to do dialysis three times a week. Um, and either the dialysis clinics were closed or they couldn't get there. Um, I ran one patient who he left his medications at work um, and he has a really painful form of cancer um, in his bones. And so he had to rely on EMS to get him to the hospital um, to be given those pain medications um, that, uh, that we would not be able to give him for that long period of time that he would need them before the roads became passable. Um, there were also just so many different stories of people who ran out of oxygen who couldn't use their CPAP machines on at night. I think CPAP is a very, very common medical device that many um, of our community use. And when the power went out, a lot of people um, were unable to sleep, unable to get the oxygen that they need at night. And so we just learned so many people um, really do take care of their own medical needs, but rely on oxygen um, that week. And, and we heard so many terrible stories and I, I could really go on and on, but I, I think there, there are a lot was, of other questions. No, there was one that, um, that there was, there was one that uh, you mentioned when we talked uh, last year that I think also stuck with me. And it was, it was a, a, a young woman, I think you mentioned who had been living in her car and she had run out of um, feel to, to warm her car and had, you know, taken pills and, and you were seeing more attempted suicides, you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And then I'll, I'll, I'll jump to, to Cliff as well. Yeah. I, I think that's a really good category that we don't talk enough about is the mental health struggles that we saw during that week. Um, I absolutely took people to the hospital that were having panic attacks that were just tired of being so cold and not knowing when the electricity would come back. Um, the particular case that you're talking about is somebody um, who's experiencing homelessness, but did have a car, um, was actually at the time living um, at her workplace. Um, her boss knew about it and it was supposed to be a short term option until um, she could get a place. And she said that she just felt really alone um, and that it was too much for her. And so she decided to take all of her medications. Um, and, it, you know, I, I think we really don't talk enough about some of the mental health um, crises that so many people were in during that ice storm because of the um, lack of access to electricity, water, to loved ones, um, et cetera. It was, it was a very, very hard week for a lot of people, for I think the whole community. Thank you, Selena. Uh, Cliff? Yeah, if, if I may, I, I want to just underscore what Celine is saying. I think I think vulnerable populations were really affected by the storm, and uh, Selena has wonderful examples there. One example that we had up in Smith County, the ESD had to use its water tanker that it used normally uses for wa uh, wildfires in the summer. Uh, it had to use that to get water to the dialysis center so they could treat the people who had kidney problems. So it was it was devastating for a lot of folks in, who in our vulnerable pop populations. You know, both of you, I think, have touched on this. This is not the first winter storm, right? And and you have talked about icy road conditions. What made you know last year's winter storm so different? Um, you know, and I guess it Cliff, do you want to start us off and then I, I can start on that one. Yeah. Uh, and it's pretty simple. It was it was so pervasive and that it was uh, normally if if a winter storm happens, 
uh, if you if it happens in Austin, then maybe you can call Round Rock or you can call uh, San Antonio. But everybody was was hit by that because it basically glazed the entire state. And as a result, the backup that you normally have in an event like that, and you know, and Selena mentioned uh, prior storms. Uh, I remember one in 1973 where they they closed down the entire University of Texas because of it. But but this one was so broad that it uh, it uh, it prevented people from reaching out and getting help to get more help to more to people. Selena, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I don't think Perla and I remember 1973, so we yeah. weren't there for that. <laughs> um, but I, I definitely agree. I mean, even the ice storm that we had um, last weekend, it only affected a central swath of Texas. Um, and I know that Governor Abbott said we had quite a bit of power left over, um, but I just am wondering what- well, would Governor happen. Abbott had, had, had a reason to say that, I think. <laughs> but if the whole state had been inundated the same way, I think the biggest issue is exactly like Cliff said, we, we've had icy roads before, um, and that definitely has caused some major issues. I mean, I remember, you know, three, four years ago when we had um, just a lot of ice on the overpasses, um, so many cars were stranded and we thought that was a really big deal. And I think obviously the biggest problem is that we just saw major infrastructure fail um, one system by another system um, when the electricity went out. That was terrible. But then on top of that, the water went out and that was another crisis on top of that. And I, and I think we also don't really talk about um, the water crisis enough as well, because um, a lot of our hospitals, a lot of other places, they're actually, they use water heaters to, to heat their whole systems. And we had hospitals almost closed because of the water system shut down. And so I think all of these systems toppling one after another um, is what really made this a humanitarian crisis. And I did do want to get back to that point, but I think, you know, before I move on, we've talked about communities being impacted and and you've given us you know a lot of, of examples and, and you as you said you can go on with story after story about you know Texans suffering through this can we talk a little bit about the first responders as well you know a lot of these emergency departments were getting two three four times as many calls as they normally get a lot of the first responders themselves and their families were going through a lot of the same issues that we were going through with electricity without water from what I remember, Selena, when we had talked uh, last year, I mean, you know, there were working ridiculous amounts of hours, um, unable to get home, unable to even sometimes go to a hotel. I mean, can you can 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 we talk about them as well as as we take into consideration the toll the storm had on all of us? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll jump in. Um, I I think that. That that happened um, a year after the pandemic, right when we felt like we kind of understood COVID, that things were at a at a low point in COVID. And so I think for our first responders, our healthcare workers to be slammed with another crisis like that um, really put a lot of people over the edge. Um, I heard stories about medics who did not drink water for 24 hours because they didn't know when their next bathroom break would be. Um, people swallowing pain medications um, dry because they didn't want to drink water. Um, I mean, I went to our communication center and saw a lot of our dispatchers and call takers, um, and I tried to talk to them and see how it was going, and I couldn't even get an, a word in edgewise because they were just there was so many calls to answer, so many people to talk to. Um, and, you know, and our communication workers were talking about how they didn't even feel comfortable going to go pee because even leaving for that five minutes um, would have placed a bigger burden on everybody else. Um, I think a lot of people also really feared for their life that week. Um, I talked to a medic who told me that they had their finger on our emergency activation button because they were so convinced that their ambulance would fall off an overpass, that they would be driving on a road, and because of the snow, they wouldn't be able to see um, where the, the sides of the road were and fall into a ditch and tumble over. And we had so many ambulances get trapped 
during that week too. Um, I think I remember at one time there were over four ambulances that were stuck and couldn't get out of the ice. Um, and so, so many people, um, you know, and exactly like you said, experiencing flooding, experiencing families without power. Um, a lot of our medics had newborns um, that they had to leave um, for to work. And we had people who even got in accidents trying to get to work, trying to do the saving. I have one medic who um, got in a car accident on the way to work, um, had such a bad concussion, is still not able to work today. Um, and so the effects of the ice storm have been lasting. And I think one of the other things that we um, that we talk about as a community is just this lack of trust in our infrastructure. And we saw our local governments, we saw our state governments really falter in these in this crisis. And so I think a lot of our medics um, and first responders, you know, even in EMS, although um, we are the social safety net. Although people call us in their biggest emergencies, medics also know that we can call a commander, we can call police officers, we can call firefighters for help if we if we need them. And I think during this week, we really felt like there, there was nobody else to call. Um, because if we tried to call for um, police to come, we didn't know if they would be available. If we tried to call for a commander to come, we didn't know how long it would take or if they would be available. And we just saw a lot of the systems that we take for granted really fail. And, and I think it really shook a lot of our medics to the core. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I, from, uh, I think our, the experience of most of the ESDs were very similar to that and that, that they were, the their responders were stretched very thin. And we're seeing from our ESDs now a whole lot of uh, uh, re adjusting to make make sure that doesn't happen quite as bad as it does it did last time uh they're they're putting cots into uh fire stations they're uh getting mres they're making sure there's adequate water supplies and uh, so that they're they're they can station at they may even bring their families to station at the, the fire station and uh, they don't have to worry about being out on the on the roads Thank, thank you, Cliff. Um, you know why? You know why should Texans prepare for another winter storm? And I think you know that's also the title of our discussion today. Can we? Can who would want to take that? Uh, Selena, do you want to start us off? You know why should we? Why should we prepare for another one? Yeah, I I think what we're seeing with climate change is that it, it's not that the earth is going to just get hotter and that's all we're gonna see, that Texas summers are gonna be worse. I think what we're seeing is really unpredictable weather. And so you have tornadoes in places that you wouldn't expect them. You have more devastating um, climate events. And I think the ice storm um, was a really good example of that. And I think that while people understand that it can get really cold, it can ice, that's happened before, even in the seventies, um, that they don't expect our water to go out. They don't expect our power to go out. And so I, I, I think we have to recognize that we can't always expect what's going to happen next. And so that's why we have to be prepared because we can't expect that we're going to have exactly another ice storm um, and everything's going to follow exactly like it did in 2021. Um, and so people have to be individually prepared because we just don't, we can't super easily predict what's going to happen if we're only looking at what's happened to us in the past. Exactly. That's, there's a saying that uh, generals always prepare for the, the previous war, which is why they really screw up on the next war. And uh, if you end up uh, planning for Yuri uh, for the next Yuri to be exactly like the last Yuri, you're you're going to be in, in real real trouble. Uh, fire uh, fire departments and utilities all use all hazards consequence management planning, and that is that that no matter what the hazard is, there are consequences that they know is going to be coming. Uh, loss of electric power, uh, loss of water and wastewater uh, service, uh, loss of fuel supplies, loss of food uh, availability. All those can come for whether it's whether it's uh, winter storm Uri or just a blizzard in Amarillo or uh, a tornado in Fort Worth or a hurricane on the Gulf Coast. All those consequences can happen. 
And so everybody in Texas needs to be prepared for that because it's going to happen again. It, it, it happened. It happened before climate change became an issue. It's it it will happen again. And even if you say that the uh, uh, that it's not going to be that's going to be worse. Yes, it could be worse, but it's still going to happen. And if it's a, if it's a, uh, you know, a lot of people when their hurricane season comes, they look out and they go, oh, it's only a cat one hurricane. We don't have to worry about it. Well, a cat one hurricane that goes through your living room uh, might as well be a cat five because you are in real trouble. And so you have to be prepared for even a little minor consequence. And that's, uh, uh, that's absolutely essential. This brings us to, no, to another point that I think uh, both of you and, and we've all made it at different points in this conversation is about all these different systems, you know, any shortcoming that different systems face compounded each other, right? And I think we we tend to look at things in silos, emergency systems, or, you know, what our lawmakers are doing at the state level, uh, state level, what our politicians are doing at the federal level. And I think in situations like what we saw last year, you know, if there were any failures or shortcomings, they were very evident, you know, for example, with hospitals uh, running out of water and that affected ambulances trying to deliver patients or uh, one big series that we focused on, one investigation that that we did was on carbon monoxide poisonings. And, and you saw, you know, through our reporting, we, fa- we, we found how all these shortcomings came together to make the situation so much worse to what experts told us was the, you know, the biggest epidemic, CO poisoning epidemic in recent U.S. history. And it's not that um, all these things are isolated, right? We saw people who, you know, the vulnerable communities we were talking about that we were all affected by URI, but we were all able to respond to it differently, right? I, I still had a car that I could go to. I had the financial means to move to a hotel if I needed to. Um, I did not lose water, et cetera. So, you know, looking at all of that together, why is it important that we, when we try to address the the problem, that we look at it holistically? And I'll start with you, Selena, or or Cliff, if you want to take. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, I'm I'm really chewing on the bit on this one, right? Because I don't think I don't think silos is not exactly the right uh, uh, analogy. It's real because silos can stand up there and, and they're, they're fine out in the middle of the cornfield or wherever. They're really more dominoes because what happened was the natural gas domino fell that brought down the electrical grid domino, which brought down the water domino, which fell right in the middle of the uh, emergency response do- domino and the healthcare domino. And all those, the dominoes really fell hard in, in winter storm Uri. And I think, as you say, they've got to start communicating better. Now, the legislature last year passed Senate Bill 3, which was the measure to try to, to address some of that. And they, they did, that does address, there has to be some communication between the natural gas industry and the electrical generating industry. And that's great. But there's not in Senate Bill 3 any directive to uh, water utilities to start talking to their fire departments that 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 rely on water uh, you might you know water is pretty important to putting out fires and uh, uh, if you look at Senate bill three it's 51 pages of it there, the word fire is only in there once and it's in in terms of a uh, uh, a directive to TDM to put out some information about how to deal with uh, emergencies like fire so the, it, what the water utilities and the fire departments need to be talking to each other about what happens when there isn't fire, uh, water to fight, put out fires. Uh, that happened in Bear County. Uh, there was a big apartment fire. Uh, maybe somebody brought their hibachi in to turn, turn on, use that for heating. And, uh, but the uh, fire hydrants were frozen. So they had to go get their water tender, again, that usually used for wildland fires, to, so they could, could uh, address that in the middle of uh, in the middle of San Antonio. Um, that communication needs to happen. Those those dominoes need to be talking to each other. You know, and, and one of our our readers and participants did send a question asking um, 
you know, what, what tangible ways is the state in its various jurisdictions taking care of its most vulnerable populations, especially low to no income and, and the homeless. And I think, you know, even the little data that we have, for example, regarding CO poisonings, what we found from the state's health department is that the reported cases, 42% of them were children, nearly three fourths of them were uh, black, Asian and, and or Hispanic um, Texans. You know, uh, in terms of the power outages, there was a report that found that it, it, areas that had um, a higher share of, of communities of color were four times, I believe, more likely to go to have a power outage. You know, what what um, what can can the state and I think the messaging and, and we've talked about this, right? How do you reach this community? So, you know, uh, George, to to answer George's question and maybe Selena, you can take this. What are some tangible ways um, that the state and various jurisdictions, you know, can can take care of of those who are the most vulnerable during during situations like this. Yeah, I, I really love Cliff's um, analogy about the dominoes, and that's exactly how I used to describe each system coming down. I think one thing, um, especially when we're talking about people who are responsible for vulnerable communities, is that we all have to be a little bit emergency hardened. Um, one of the things that we saw that was almost another catastrophe is a lot of nursing homes lost power um, and they didn't have the staff um, that could come in. And so one nursing home asked EMS to evacuate all 150 patients. Um, and that was just going, that would have completely shut down um, a few hospitals. If you think about ER's capacities being, you know, maybe 50 people, depending on how large, um, that's just a back of the envelope number. Um, but, you know, our medics were able to think quick on their feet. They found a great room that had a fireplace. They were able to light it and move all of the residents into that um, into that room, but the state ledge did work to make sure that nursing homes um, and other places that are responsible for a lot of people do have generators and backup generators. But I think a lot of these um, types of places that are responsible for a lot of people um, need to make sure that they're better prepared for these types of things. Um, as far as how do we make resiliency and low income populations and uh, other places that um, have that had a high proportion of um, uh, water going out, power going out. Um, I think that all communities need to do a better job at translating more information um, and also reaching out to community leaders in those communities um, to help get the word out. Um, it, it's In my old job at Texas Impact, we created um, a bulletin for churches to kind of have a phone tree to really know all of their folks that are vulnerable and make sure that everybody gets touched. And so I think communities are really going to have to take it upon themselves to make sure that um, they have the means to reach out to everybody um, and know what the needs of the community might be. Um, I don't think there's a perfect state solution um, because it, you know, this, the state solution is really fundamental to everything. Um, make sure, you know, expand Medicaid, um, make sure that we have broadband. Um, there are a lot of things that aren't specifically related to emergency, but that just do the best to bring up all votes. The the uh, the state did pass uh, Senate Bill nine nine sixty eight last year, which requires cities and, and uh, counties to uh, make checks on people who are registered as vulnerable uh, entities. Uh, and th th there's three checks they have to make. One can be a robocall. Uh, if if they don't get an answer, then that then they have a in-person call. If that doesn't happen, then you send somebody out to their their uh, their place. I, I'm not an attorney, but there was it, it. It seemed to me there wasn't exactly any indication of what you do if they're not good when they get out and do that check, right? So I think uh, the TDM will be making some adjustments or some regulations uh, around that, uh, and so that will be interesting to see where that comes out. Thanks, Cliff. I didn't know about that. Um, can I just ask a question? If, if you know, so, because the other question is, you know, in these emergencies, all of our emergency services are already completely tapped anyway. I know. Yeah. And so, exactly. how are they going to also touch? Uh, I believe I, I believe the Texas Association of County has been talking about that very same thing. Uh, uh, 
it would be important to follow up, right? But we, we're running a little short on time and I do want to leave participants with practical advice and tips. So I'm sorry for, for the interruption, but I do want, if, if you can both uh, cite a couple of, you know, how can we better prepare? We've been talking about, we need to prepare for this. You know, what is some practical advice that you have for, for our viewers um, and attendees? A couple of points each. For me, I think we saw with this ice storm, um, our community does know how to be prepared. Um, I saw, I mean, a lot of people were at our HEBs getting their groceries in advance. Um, people knew to buy batteries. Um, we saw generator sales going through the roof. And so our communities do know um, what they need to do to be prepared. Um, it's as basic as having a preparedness um, disaster kit. Um, it's as basic as just knowing where you can get the latest information and make sure that you do have access to backup power. Um, it's making sure that you have enough medications it's making sure that if you have family or friends in nursing homes um, in other vulnerable situations um, on dialysis, that they know what the backup plans are for the nursing home, for the dialysis clinics, um, in case something were to happen to them. Um, so I was really impressed with how Austin um, and other places prepared for this ice storm. And so I, I really believe in our residents to be able to do it for the next one as well. I have a couple of thoughts. Yeah, uh, I think in, I think the message that or the well the takeaway that we got from Winter Storm Yuri is that you have to be kind of self reliant because help may not be coming really fast. Uh, uh, if if you have a plumbing emergency, you're not going to get a plumber uh, that same day because one they may not even be able able to make it through on the roads. So there's self reliance that you got to have, and and. Uh, and at the same time, though, I, I, I have a friend who uh, in Austin who made it a point to go around and talk to her neighbors because she didn't know how how to get in touch with them and, and to check on them. And I think there's self-reliance, but also being able to find a new community that you can uh, rely on for help until the, uh, the fire uh, truck gets there or the ambulance gets there. Um, and I guess I want... Uh, just as a practical matter, uh, www.texasready.gov has a whole bunch of materials. We have a link on our website, www.safe-d.org, that takes you to CDC, uh, uh, to um, American Red Cross, and to FEMA, and all those. Uh, there's a, a lot of information out there. You just have to realize that you are going to have to be prepared for something. It may not be Winter Storm Uri, but you're going to have to be prepared for something. Well, thank you both so, so very much. And with that, we're we're out of time. And thank you for tuning in. And again, thank you, Selena Shi and Cliff Avery for joining me today. Uh, for more coverage from the Texas Tribune, visit texastribune.org and help us keep the conversation going by becoming a Texas Tribune member at texastribune.org slash give. Again, I can't thank you enough for, for your time today. We, we, it was very, uh, it was very helpful.